Perdican Forest was a very important <coughs> target of the American army, and it was a large, a large thing. It was maybe 15 miles square. And uh, General Hodge, who was the army uh, commander, I forget which army it was, but it was. He did that. He, he sent division after division into it, trying to, to make it safe, uh, destroy all the Germans there. Well, the weather turned bad. Uh, a lot of things happened that coincided to make it one of the great mistake areas of the Second World War. It used up, as I remember, nine infantry divisions without making any progress at all. And General Hodge would replace one division with another, and then that would be wiped out, and that had to be replaced by another, and so it was bizarre. If this had happened in the, <coughs> in the Vietnam War, there would have been a mutiny or something, but nothing, the, the troops didn't complain. Uh, very much. They complained quite a lot. But it was, it, this was never reported, the Battle of the Hurricane Forest, and it's well known among, <coughs> among uh, survivors. One of them, I think I talk about this man in the book, The Boy's Crusade. He was, a, <coughs> he was an officer, I think a major at that time, commanding a battalion, and it was Thanksgiving. That's what it was, Thanksgiving Day. And uh, General Eisenhower had ordered that every soldier was, was to have a turkey dinner on that day, no matter his, his situation on the line. <clears throat> and at that point, a bombing of the, our own troops took place. To the extent that this officer, who is now probably younger than I am, uh, survived, and every Thanksgiving day he can't stand it. He goes out to the backyard, and in silence, sort of cries himself into an appropriate elegiac uh, emotion. He still cannot get over this ridiculous wipeout of his unit. Well, this is fairly common because war is an irrational performance. And even the, the rules, the tactical rules that you follow, like always attacking from the flank if you can find it, and so on, govern and give the impression that it's a rational proceeding, like, say, a football game, where there are visible rules and they're followed and so forth. And um, nobody can ever understand that who hasn't been in it because it's it's described in books that have nice pages and the lines are properly the same length and things like that. No, nothing surprising or shameful in the presentation of it, but it is full of shame and outrage and so on. Patton, one reason I'm interested in him was his guts in firing generals, division commanders who weren't any good, who were scared to death or who were too complicated, or who missed the point, and so on, he'd send them back to the States and replace them with people. And he used that, he, he, he told people that all the time. He said, if you don't capture that town, you're through. I'm going to get rid of you and replace you. And he would annoy them, annoy the subordinate commanders by saying things like, would you give me the names of two or three major generals that you'd like to replace you when I fire you? and so on. In other words, get into action or you're finished, and so forth. So there was a lot of that sort of stuff, change of commands that were covered by various uh, rational excuses. Paul, you talk a lot also about something else that we don't hear about, men deserting and men running in, her, in, in droves in the bulge and deserting apparently in droves in Hurtgen where Eddie Slovak, the only deserter shot in World War II on the American side, he deserted in the Hurtgen Force. Why don't you talk a little bit about this running and this deserting? That's right. Well, poor Private Slovak was selected to be executed <clears throat> as a morale mechanism because there were so many complaints and desertions occasioned by the Hurtgen Forest business that Eisenhower realized these have got to be stopped somehow. And no deserter had ever been shot 
in that war. They'd been given, you know, mild punishment. So he said to himself, this is the time to invoke the death penalty for desertion. So he had, uh, he had Danny Slovic uh, shot by a firing squad, and he had that news publicized widely in the Army, hoping to stem this vogue of running away. Uh, that's all I know about that because it was that didn't take place in my unit, and I never learned about that until after the war was over. But that, that's an example of the sort of problems uh, faced by high command. I mean, things that can be solved only by invoking some solution which you deplore. Because so many people were running. That's right. You couldn't kill them all. You had to choose an example and so forth. It didn't do much good. This excerpt is brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law, the leader of reform in legal education and a leader in multimedia education for the public. To view the full interview and for a full listing of MSL's programs, log on to mslaw.edu.